Hi, this is Bart Paulson, and in this video, um, we're looking at the practice final for Behavioral Science 3010, Statistics for Behavioral Sciences at Utah Valley University. Uh, this is the eighth part, and hopefully the last one. We're going to begin with question number 63. The difference between a predicted Y score and an actual observed Y score, um, that actually means you've done regression because uh, you get an equation with a slope and an intercept, and you take a person's X score, uh, so for instance, like their height, and you use it to predict their score on Y, for instance, their weight, and then you have this difference between what you predict and what is what is in fact the case. Um, is known as A, the imperfection coefficient. That's kind of cute. I've never heard of that term. B, the error ratio. No, that's not it. C, the residual. That is the correct answer. The difference between what is predicted and for that particular person and what actually and what they actually got is the residual. Um, so it's C. Anyhow. 64, with a big gap in the middle here. Which of the following is true about regression towards the mean? Okay, regression towards the mean. Um, this is a situation that says that when people have really extreme scores on one variable or measured at one point in time, that their scores are almost always less extreme on another variable or at another point in time. So things tend to regress or return towards the mean values. Uh, they, they move away from the extremes and back towards, and that's usually the case. Um, the original studies on that was done, I mentioned, as uh, the, the height of fathers and sons. Um, extremely tall fathers tended to have tall sons, but not as tall as they were. Extremely short fathers tended to have sons who were short, but not as short as they were. They, again, the, the height of their sons regressed or returned towards the average or the mean height. So anyhow, it says here, uh, choice A, predicted Y values will not always be perfect unless R is equal to plus or minus 1. Well, oh, okay, that's true, actually. Uh, you, The only time you can make a perfect prediction is when the correlation has an absolute value of 1. That means every dot is exactly on the regression line. Um, B, predicted Y values tend to be farther away from the mean of y than the observed values of x are to the mean of x. Oh, jeez. Um, uh, no, that is that is not correct. Because um, that what that is saying is that the prediction has even is more spread out than the predictor variable, and it, it's usually the opposite that the predictions are less spread out. Um, Got to look at that. Okay, and then this last one, C, predicted Y values will have more variation than actual observed values of Y. Uh, that, you know, that's almost never the case um, because the predicted values are on this straight line and, and uh, observed values are kind of spread out all over the place. Um, so I'm going to go with A on this one. The predicted Y values will not always be perfect unless R is equal to exactly plus or minus 1. Okay. 65. Which of the following is an impossible value for R squared? Um, so that should actually be squared up, you know, up the top. Um, R squared means you've taken the correlation coefficient, which is called R, and you've squared it. And because... Uh, R squared values are because correlation values go from zero to one it can be positive or negative. When you square them, they're going to get smaller. They're going to go closer to zero because you know it's like taking a half of a half as a quarter. Um, anyhow, what's an impossible value for R squared? Zero. No, you can get that. Zero squared is zero. Point uh, sixteen. You can get that. Um, if you started with a correlation of point four, you'd end up with a R squared of point sixteen. Uh, Point thirty six, yeah. If you started with a correlation of point six, you would have an R squared of point thirty six. One point ten. No, that is impossible because it is beyond the upper boundary. You you can't square anything between zero and one and end up with one ten. So D is the correct answer in that it is the impossible answer for R squared. All right, sixty six. Correlations may not be interpretable for which type of relationship? Uh, direct relationship. I think that means like a positive relationship, but I'm not familiar, you know. 
Inverse relationships, so things as one goes up, the other one goes down. No, that's fine. C, nonlinear. Okay, correlations and regressions assume a linear relationship between the variables. So you can draw a nice straight line through all the dots on the scatter plot. That's the standard approach. If the relationship is not linear, if it's not a straight line, then using the standard correlation regression is going to be problematic. So for 66, the answer is C. Nonlinear uh, would be a problem for interpreting correlations. Okay, 67. Which of the following illustrates a negative correlation? All right. So we're looking where when a person is high on one variable, they become lower on the other. Similarly, if they're low on one, they're higher on the other. So here we have the more often a person exercises, the more muscle mass they will accumulate. Well, that's high on both, so that's a positive correlation. B, the more often a person visits the dentist, the fewer cavities they have. Well, more visits, fewer cavities. That is a negative correlation, so B is correct. Uh, C, as a person writes less, the quality of their writing decreases. Well, that's that's less on both, so that's that's actually... This, let me just note, C is a positive correlation, even though it's worded negatively, because it says if you're low on one, you're low on the other. So by contrast, by, by uh, inference, if you're high on one, you're high on the other. And then D, the less often a person gets sick, the less sick days they would need to take off. Again, that is also a positive correlation, but worded with the negative end, meaning the less of one, the less of the other. Again, you're looking for a flip, so it's B. The more you do this one thing, the less you have of the other. So that's B is an example. 68, a researcher calculating a Pearson R, that's a correlation coefficient, found that there was no relationship between X and Y. So again, like between high school and college GPA. The effect size for the data is not negative one, that'd be a pretty strong negative, actually that'd be a perfect negative correlation. Negative five, no. Uh, C, zero. Uh, the effect size we're using here is probably R or R squared, and uh, yeah, it'd be a correlation of zero. So C is the correct answer for this one. Uh, and, and 20 is just another, you know, point 20 is just another non-zero value. Okay, 69. When Pearson's R is negative, variables are said to have an inverse relationship. When it's positive, they're said to have a direct relationship. That's what I said a moment ago. Okay, so they have an inverse relationship. What does this mean? Okay, the first one, A, is that X and Y increase or decrease together. No, they don't move together. They move contrary-wise. They move opposite of each other. B, that X and Y are not correlated. No, that's a correlation of zero. Um that X and Y are outside the appropriate range, that, that's that's nothing. That's just thrown in. Uh, ignore that one. D, that when X increases, Y decreases. Yes, that is correct. Negative correlation means that as one variable, values on one variable go up, they go down on the other. So D is the correct answer. 70, the closer Pearson's R correlations are to negative 1 or positive 1, the blank the relationship between X and Y is. Actually, it's stronger. A is stronger because uh, an absolute value of 1 is a perfect linear correlation uh, for Pearson's R. And so, yeah, 0 is no relationship at all. Plus or minus 1 is a perfect relationship. So, uh, A, it's stronger, A. Uh, it would only be weaker if they were approach if they were going towards 0. More insignificant, that's cute, because we don't even use the term insignificant in statistics. We talk about non-significant, so that's and and D truer. Um, we don't talk about true or false in this way. So anyhow, it's A. 71. A data set has a non-linear relationship between two variables. Again, what that means is it's not a straight line to, that you can draw on the scatter plot. It's uh, something else, a curved line, an angled line. Which of the following calculations which of the calculations below are affected by this problem? A, means. Um, means are calculated separately for each variable, and we're talking about an association here, so it's not going to be that. Uh, B, standard deviations. Again, that's a univariate statistic, uh, so the fact that it's nonlinear relationship is irrelevant. C, variances, also univariate. Association doesn't matter. D, Pearson's R. Well, that's basically saying what we said a moment ago, the same way that Pearson's R, the correlation, the Pearson product moment correlation coefficient, assumes that there is a straight line that you can draw through a scatter plot. Um, and if it's not a straight line, if it's a nonlinear relationship, then you have a problem. Pearson's R uh, 
can't deal well with it. But there are ways to deal with this. You can actually do what's called a rank order correlation coefficient, or you can do something called a transformation of the variables, which straightens them out, and that's okay to do as long as you say what you did. But just take it as is, nonlinear curves, bad for correlations, uh, Pearson's are. 72, which statistic is defined as the proportion of variance accounted in the dependent variable by the independent variable? Okay, sometimes called proportion of, it can also be called proportion of variance explained. Um, a, chi-squared. Now, chi-squared is an inferential statistic for looking at the distributions of two categorical variables. That's not it. B, R-squared. We just got to get that two up to the superscript. And yes, that actually is the correct one. R-squared is the same thing as the proportion of variance accounted for or explained, at least in a correlation or regression setting. So R-squared is the answer. Uh, C, the range. That's just how far things vary on one variable. That, that has nothing to do with this. And the mode, that's just, again, that's a univariate statistic. So C and D are just totally irrelevant. 73. What is the minimum level of measurement to calculate a Pearson's R correlation coefficient? Again, I've talked about this. Uh, a similar question came up earlier. The answer for this is A, interval, because interval uh, has is able to say how far apart each score is. They, they come in set units. And um, ratio has that and an absolute zero. So interval or ratio, the quantitative statistics, those work for Pearson's R. Uh, nominal and ordinal usually don't. Now, there are some important exceptions to that, but the answer for the question on this test is A, interval. That's the minimum level of measurement by standard uh, practices. Okay, 74. If R, that's the correlation coefficient, equals 0. 0.65, then the members in the sample who have blank values on the independent variable have blank values on the dependent variable. Okay. It's a positive association, and it's, it's non-zero. So people who are lower on one would be lower on the other. That's A. That's correct. Um, and again, that's tricky because when people look at positive correlations, they think that means higher and higher. Well, lower and lower is just the other side of the coin. So lower and lower is correct. Uh, hot, uh, answer B, higher and lower is a negative correlation. Um, C, lower and higher, is also a negative correlation, and D, no relationship, that, was, that would be true if the correlation were zero. So the answer is A. Even though it says positive correlation, if they're lower on one and lower on the other, that implies that if they're higher on one than they're higher on the other, it's a positive correlation. And our very last one. For the five data points in the scatter plot below, we actually don't have it below, the correlation is R equals 0.95, as shown with the regression line. Why is Pearson's R a problematic statistic, statistic to summarize the relationship for these data? Okay, okay, so it's not showing us the uh, the picture in this one, but I can show you what it looks like. If you, um, I've I've got a similar uh, statistic uh, one right here. It comes from what's called Anscombe's Quartet, which I show in our chapter on um, uh, regression. Anyhow, what you see here is that you've got all these lines, these dots that are just stacked up on top of each other here on the left. And you got this one that's way over here by itself. You can do a regression for this. The problem is this is nowhere close to a, the linear relationship that is uh, supposed by correlation regression. It's in fact it's kind of an opposite of it. Um, so let's take a quick look at the question again. For the five data points in the scatter point below, the correlation is R.95. So yeah, that's 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 fine. Why is Pearson's R a problematic st statistic to summarize the relationship for these data? Um, a says the data do not consist of pairs of scores on two variables. Well, that's that's not true. I mean, you look at this one. Each person has the dot represents a pair. It's just uh, the way things are distributed. The scatter plot implies that X causes Y. It's not possible for a scatter plot to do that. That's something that's inferred from the design of the study. Uh, C, the Pearson's R value is mathematically impossible. That's not true. 0.95 is possible. It doesn't happen very often because it's very high, but it can happen. And then D, the outlier distorts the relationship between X and Y. And that one is absolutely correct. It distorts it completely. So for 75, the answer is D. And that is every question on the sample final. And I hope that's going to help you a lot when test time comes around. Thanks for listening.